moment to kneel and have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this wonderful day. We thank you so much for this sacred time, this holy convocation where we can come apart and to be able to study, to gain a fresh pouring of your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would be with our hearts and our minds. Lord, that that which is communicated will be a blessing for us spiritually and practically, and that our spirits may be buoyed up as we seek to work in cooperation with you for the finishing of this work. We pray that you be with all those who may be on their way. We pray that you keep them safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, even before we get started, I'll, I'll ask this question. Uh, why did you come to this convocation? Why did you come to this convocation? Now, there's only a few of us here, so by God's grace, we'll have more time to interact. So why did you come to this convocation? Why are you at this convocation? Did you just come to this convocation simply because this was just an event that was happening, or did you come for a very specific reason? Okay, why did you come to this convocation? Okay. Yeah. That's good. That's good. That's very good. Uh, what about you? <laughs> this is your place. This is your place. You know, we're, we're, we're told, I was, I was praying about this as my wife and I was, uh, were preparing for this, uh, these, these meetings. We are encouraged that, especially at these convocations, that this is a special and a holy time where God is really seeking to pour out his spirit upon us. And so even though that this is just a few short days, God wants to use this opportunity to be transformative for us, spiritually, mentally, and physically. Now, does anybody know what uh, the, the title of this particular session is? Does anybody know what the title of this particular session is? All right, so I was informed that the title of this is Our Preparation and Call to the Gospel Ministry. Now, who here is in the gospel ministry? By a show of hands. All right, so we're all here in the gospel ministry. So by the grace of God, this, this is actually going to go through our experience, particularly my experience, as to how the Lord brought me into the ministry. Now, do you think it's important to understand how God leads us? Is it important to understand how to get properly into the gospel ministry? Yes, it is. Now, let's, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. Now, unfortunately, it's already 1022. So I'm, I'm going to really try not to rush too much, but I definitely want to get to a point. So Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 11. All right, it says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their what? Of their testimony. It says, and they love not their lives unto the what? They love not their lives unto the death. So the Bible is here bringing out the principle that we overcome by what mechanism? By our testimony, by our testimony. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through some of the intricacies of my experience and how, this, how God segued me into the gospel ministry. Now, we're going to go over some very practical points, even in this particular uh, session. All right, now, what is this right here? All right, this is, a, this is a telephone. Now, this is a symbol of the telephones that used to be used in a bygone age. Now, are these the telephones that we use today? No, they're not. This is ancient technology. Now, in order for this phone to ring, what had to come to this phone? A call, a call had to come to this phone. Now notice this, this is from a book called Evangelism. Who here has heard of the book Evangelism? Now do you think that we need to go through the book Evangelism if we want to do evangelism? Yes, yes, yes we do. It says, often we have been told that our cities are to hear the, mes to hear the message, but, but how slow are we to heed the instruction? It says, I saw one. Now, when that says one, who do you think that, it was, that is referring to? That's referring to Christ. 
It says, standing on a high platform with arms extended, he turned and pointed in every direction. It says, a world perishing in ignorance of God's holy law and Seventh-day Adventists are wide awake. Is that what it says? It says that they are, they are asleep. Now, do you think that is a good thing to be asleep spiritually? Now, when you are asleep spiritually, what type of practices are you engaging in? What type of practices do you enge- can a person engage in to make them come under the stupor of Satan? Yeah, so, so what, what, what are activities that are associated with the kingdom of darkness? Say it again. Entertainment. What else? Partying, entertainment, sexual immorality. All of these things keep us in impenetrable darkness. Now, do you think that today that Seventh-day Adventists are engaging in these type of darknesses? Yes. Unfortunately, the vast majority. It says the Lord is what for laborers? Now, when someone is pleading for something, uh, how do they look when they're pleading for something? Yes, they're desperate. They're very desperate. Let's turn to Matthew chapter, let's turn to Matthew chapter 9. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 9. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 9. Oh, that's Mark. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 9. Let's notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 36. It says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with anger upon them. Is that what it says? He was moved with compassion. Now, do you think that we need compassion in order to do the work of God? Yes, we're told that compassion and empathy is the very springboard of effective service. This is in the book Education. It says, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no what? Now, in principle, did they have shepherds? Did they have visible shepherds? Yes. Uh, Who are the shepherds of the people at this time? Yes. So the religious class were supposed to be the, the shepherds of the people of God. But why did Jesus in this statement say that there were no shepherds? They weren't really shepherding. They weren't really shepherding. The Bible calls them hirelings. It says, then saith he unto the disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are are few. Verse 38, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his what? Into his harvest. That he will send forth laborers into his harvest. It says, the Lord is pleading for laborers, for there is a great work to be done. There are conversions to be made that will add to the church such as shall be what? Saved. Now, this is, does anybody know what Bible text this is uh, quoting from? This is taken from the book of Acts, the book of Acts chapter 2. It says, men and women are in the highways and byways are to be reached. Now, particularly, I function as a gospel minister with uh, various things associated but you don't have to be a gospel minister to be called to the ministry. Does that make sense? Because in principle, are all of us called to be gospel workers? Yes, we are. We're called to win souls. All right. Now, this is a symbol of the ministry that the Lord has given to my wife and I, a ministry called Glad Tidings 3 a.m. Now, again, we're talking about the call to gospel ministry, so we're going to see some of how this call came, how this call came. All right. Anybody know who this is? This is me. This is actually me when I was younger. I was maybe about four or five years old. So the call to gospel ministry came when I was very, very young. Now let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 23. Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 23. Notice what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 23. Now, this is a principle. Before each and every one of us were even born, did God call us to a work? 
Yes, he did. The Bible says that before I even formed you in the womb, that I did what? I knew thee. I set you apart. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23, it says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw he was a what child? He was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. So when did the call for Moses to do his grand work, when did it come? When he was a child, even before he was born. Now, what was taking place among the Israelites? What were the Egyptians doing to the Israelites so as to prevent the rising up of a deliverer? What were they doing? Yes, they were killing the, the little boys especially. And so as a result of this, Satan understood that if I was going to kill this deliverer, I had to do it in his infancy. Does that make sense? You see, this is one of the very reasons why Satan is so intent on making sure that children go through much trauma when they're little. Does that make sense? Satan does this intentionally because very many times, a lot of the ills that we see in society is because of the trauma that many persons have experienced in their childhood. The mass shootings, the, 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 the destruction, all the bombs and all of these different type of things, a lot of times this is because of trauma experience in the adolescent. Is, is a molestation a very big problem in society today? Yes, it is. Are many of our little children getting molested and, and, and destroyed, whether it be little boys and little girls? You know, it's a very sad uh, statistic. I believe it's maybe like 60% of women get molested uh, through their adolescence. And unfortunately, this is a very big problem in the church. Now, do you think that there are little girls and little boys being molested in the church? Yes. Now, do you think that God is seeking to provide a solution for this issue? Yes, he is. And by the grace of God, he wants to use us as agents in order to help people dealing with these problems. So just as a background, before I was born, uh, my mother had me when she was close to 40 years old. And my mother was the last of her, uh, her sisters to have a son. And she prayed that if she were to have a son, that she would dedicate him to the Lord. And this is why she named me Samuel. And so through um, my upbringing and things like that, it's amazing when I think about it now, there were so many times where I could have died. You know, getting into car accidents, getting hit by a car, all of these different type of things, trials and tribulations in the home, stuff like that. At birth, even at birth. So for instance, um, when I was in my mother's womb, unfortunately, I swallowed my fecal matter. I, had a, I defecated in my mother's womb and I swallowed the fecal matter. And generally, uh, this can turn into a lot of complications for the child, but by God's grace, I still came out of the womb. Now, mind you, besides all of these prayers, my upbringing wasn't overtly spiritual. So I was raised Adventist. But sadly, with a lot of uh, young Adventists, we're not taught anything. So there's very little spirituality in the home. The same uh, secularism and worldliness that is seen in the world is seen in our homes. And this filters out into the church. And then many times, uh, parents, and I'm pretty sure some of us have been asked, you know, parents will come up and say, you know, well, there are so many young people that, people that are leaving the church. Can you please say something to my son or daughter because they have no desire for spiritual things? No desire. And the parents don't realize that because they weren't cultivating spirituality in their home, because they themselves weren't truly converted, could they actually give that to their children? No, they couldn't. Now, this is no defamation on our parents. I'm pretty sure that by the grace of God, many of them did the best that they could. All right, so this was me when I was younger. Notice, this is from the Desire of Ages. It says, let mothers come to Jesus with their perplexities. Now, do any of us here have any children? All right. It says, they will find grace sufficient to aid them in the management of their children. You know what's amazing? In the book, Ministry of Healing, it says that we need to give much more instruction on teaching parents how to raise their children. You know, many times when we have these convocations, we should actually have a section set apart to it where persons can come and teach our parents how to raise their children. Because if you spend time teaching parents how to raise their children, is this going to help assure their success in afterlife? Yes, it will. The gates are open for every mother who would lay her burdens at the Savior's feet. He who suffered, suffered the little children, said, suffered the little children, 
to come unto me and forbid them not, still invites the mothers to lead up their little ones to be blessed by him. It says, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his what? From his birth. This man had the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Now, do you think that this is something that God only want, wanted to do for John the Baptist? Do you think that every child was to have the Holy Spirit from their mother's womb? Yes. Yes. Our body is the temple of God. Yes. It says, if we will live in communion with God, we too may expect the divine spirit to mold our little ones, even from their what? Even from their earliest moments. Even from their earliest moments. All right. Anybody know what this is? This is a symbol of a broken home. So unfortunately, I too had a broken home. I had a broken home. So my mother was Adventist and my father was not Adventist. And I love my mother. You know, I'm pretty sure she may watch this. She probably will. But sadly, uh, there was contention in the home. So my mother and father, they fought a lot. So even though my mother was Adventist, my father would curse on my mother and my mother would curse on my father. Or sometimes it was vice versa. So this was the environment in which I was brought up in. And my father as well was an alcoholic. My father was an alcoholic, and sadly, he still is an alcoholic. On top of that, uh, he delved in, in, into some uh, extracurricular uh, curricular activities. I won't get into some of what it was, but he dabbled in those things. And sadly, even though my father was doing this, my mother didn't really take the onus upon herself to be a proper Christian. And as a result of that, it only compounded the issues that I was dealing with. So in light of my father being like this, do you think that my father and I were very close? Unfortunately, no. It's crazy. Some of the only times that we spent time together, my father would take my little sister and I to the bar. And as he was drinking his alcohol, we'd be sitting right next to him in the bar as he's doing his thing and, and, and all that stuff. And so this was the environment. And so there was a serious emotional disconnect that I had. Now, is it, now this is just a question, how do you think it affected me, the fact that I didn't have my father's love and attention? How do you think that affected me? Yes, very deeply. I had a lot of issues, you know, anger, sadness, and all of this that I was contending with. And I remember, now it wasn't just, uh, you know, the issues of my father, so we, we started having economic problems. So sometimes we got evicted out of our house, Sometimes we would have to sleep in a hotel. Sometimes we almost essentially were living in an abandoned building, even though it was, it was a house. And at times we were living in a storefront. This was the nature of what was going on. So in light of a, a child going through this, is this going to affect you? Yes, it is. And so what God did for me, um, just as far as one example, I remember I was uh, watching television and my father was in the other room watching television. He was drinking alcohol. He wasn't paying me any mind, but I looked over to my father and I started crying and I was thinking in my mind, Lord, why doesn't my father love me? Why, 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 how is he able to give so much time and attention to these other things, but he can't give me any love or affection? And from those experiences, the Lord used all of this trauma in order to draw me closer to him. And at 15, 16, I started realizing that God was permitting me to go through this to help build my character. And I'm very fortunate that, 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 uh, that, that I was willing to open up my heart to these things because a lot of times what happens when we as young people, especially you know, when we're in our teenage years, our formative years, when we go through issues, Satan uses this as a means in order, to, in order for us to drift away from God. And many of us do this. I had many friends, I'm pretty sure it was with some of us, I had many friends that I went to church with, and I mean many, many young people in, in the general vicinity, and I can really only point to a handful of the young people that I grew, grew up with that are even still in the church. And even the ones that are in the church, they're not really spiritual. They're not even remotely converted, not even remotely. And so unfortunately, I was growing up in this broken home, but God used this as an opportunity. Now, does anybody know who this man is? Joseph. Now, was Joseph a man of God? Yes, he was. But did it take time for his character to be built? Yes, yes, it did. All right, now let's turn in our Bibles. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Genesis. 
Turn our Bible to the book of Genesis, and we're going to turn to chapter uh, chapter thirty, chapter thirty-nine, and we'll, and we'll actually start in verse 30, uh, chapter thirty-eight. All right, so we're going to start in. Actually, we just started in uh, chapter 39. Uh, we're going to start in verse 1. Notice what the Bible says in, in uh, Genesis chapter 39, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, and an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought uh, him down thither. Now, this is a question. Why in the world was Joseph in this position? What had happened? Why was Joseph in this position? position. I'll say it again. He was sold as a slave. He was sold as a slave into Egypt, and unfortunately, he was brought down to that place, and he was made a slave. Now, we're not going to go through his whole experience, but the point that we really want to focus on was this travail, this traveling down into Egypt. Now, if you were about to be sold into slavery, what do you think your mindset would be? What do you think your mindset would be? Naturally, despair. Okay, what else? Anybody else? Fearful. Say it again. Fearful. fearful, yes. Very fearful. Very, very fearful. Hopeless. Now, was Joseph a prosperous man in Egypt? Yes, yes he was. That's what the Bible says. But that experience was not always like that. Notice what Patriarchs and Prophets says. This is actually from education. It says, this, we're going to read this first. It says, all, notice this statement. All who in this world render true service to God or man receive a preparatory training in the school of happiness. Is that what it says? In the school of sorrow. You see, sorrow in this life is necessary to build men and women. There is no one that has ever accomplished anything in this world of note that has not gone through sorrow and suffering. Whether it is in spiritual or religious lines, whether it's in economics, sports, whatever the case may be, a person has to go through sorrow and suffering in order to accomplish that which is great. But especially when it comes to the work of the Lord. It says the weightier the trust, the higher the service, the closer is the test and the more severe the what? The more severe the discipline. So if you're really going to accomplish great things for God, you have to go through severe discipline. How long did it take Moses to be prepared to lead Egypt? Now, was it really 40 years? It was actually 80 years. Because the, the whole accumulation of that man's experience, those 80 years, those whole 80 years, was necessary for him to do the work that God called him to do. Now, do we have 80 years to prepare to do the work of God? No, we don't. So by God's grace, as we're told in early writings, that what it has taken others years to learn, we have to learn in a few short months. All right, the closer is the test and the more severe the discipline. Okay. All right, so this is from Patriots and Prophets. With a trembling heart, he looked forward to the future. What a change in situation from the tenderly cherished son to the despised and helpless slave. Alone and friendless, what would be his lot in the strange land to which he was going? For a time, Joseph gave himself up to uncontrolled grief and terror. You see, you have to understand that becoming a slave at this time was a fate worse than death. It would be better to be dead than, be, than to be a slave in Egypt. But in the providence of God, even this experience was to be a want. Now, mind you, was it God that moved upon his brothers to sell him into slavery? No, it wasn't. But God permitted it, and he used it as an experience to bless Joseph. So though God doesn't bring turmoil and strife upon us, he permits it for the blessing of our experience. He had learned in a few hours that which might not otherwise have, uh, have taught him. Then his thoughts turned to his father's God. In his childhood, he had been taught to love and do what? 
Now the blessing is that Joseph had a God-fearing father who taught him the principles of righteousness. And this is why I really try to encourage those young people who have the privilege of having a God-fearing mother and father, please take advantage of the opportunities that you have. His soul thrilled with the high resolve to prove himself true to God under all circumstances to act as a, became a subject of the king of heaven. He would serve the Lord with what? Now notice this statement. One day's experience had been the turning point in Joseph's life. It just took one day. It didn't need to take a, a vast accumulation of years. Its terrible calamity had transformed him from a petty child to a what? Now, how old was Joseph uh, during this experience? 16, 17 years old. So Joseph, at the age of 16, 17, became a man. Now, when did Jesus become a man? At 12. So do you necessarily have to live a super long life in order to be a man or a woman? No, you don't. You just have to make the resolve to serve God with an undivided heart. With an undivided heart. Now again, God was bringing me through this experience, and by the grace of God, the Lord used this, those experiences that I mentioned in order to be a blessing to my soul. All right, now let's turn in our Bibles to the book of... Uh, John, let's turn our Bible to the book of John. And we're going to read a synopsis of what the Lord started to do in my heart. What the Lord started to do in my heart. John chapter 3. I know that we are all familiar with this. John chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Because this is one of the pre this is the prerequisite for doing proper ministry. More than all of the technical uh, things that are necessary. Verse 1, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from what? Come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be what? Now, what was Nicodemus doing in this particular instance? What was he trying to, what was he doing to Jesus? It starts with an F. We, we tend to do it sometimes, unfortunately. Nicodemus was flattering Jesus. And the reason why he was flattering Jesus was because he was unwilling to acknowledge that Christ was the Messiah. Now, was Jesus just an ordinary rabbi? No, he, was he merely a teacher sent from God? He was the divine son of God. But unfortunately, Nicodemus was not willing to acknowledge this. In verse 3, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the what? You see, the Bible makes it very clear that we have to be born again. And unfortunately, what I've seen very many times, and I'm pretty sure some of us have, have seen this as well, sadly, so many people who are engaging in gospel work are simply not converted. And sadly, Satan is using this unconversion in order to cast a, a bad reflection upon the work of God. Now, if we are sincerely converted... Is it once converted, always converted? No. We have to die what? We have to die daily. It doesn't matter what our past experience has been. If we are not dying daily, we're going to be in trouble. Was Saul converted at one point? Yes, he was. Now, did his life end in conversion? No, it didn't. That man was so strung out by the devil that he literally went to a witch in order to talk to God. This is the height of insanity, to go to the devil in order to talk to God. This is insanity. It says, its terrible calamity had transformed him from a petted child to a man, thoughtful, courageous, and self-possessed. All right, does anybody know what this is? Okay, symbol of prayer. Now, what setting is this man in? He's in a church. You see, part of the training that we have to go through, all of us, that there is a connection between Christ and his, and his church. Notice this. An education, another obligation too often lightly regarded, one that the youth awakened to the claims of Christ needs to be made plain, is the obligation of church what? Relationship. Very close and sacred is the relation between Christ and his church, he the bridegroom and the church the bride, he the head and the church the body. Connection with Christ then involves connection with his what? The church is organized for potluck. 
Is that why it's organized? The church is organized as a nice social club. And we pay dues every month. Is that what the church is organized for? No, it's organized for a service. And Ministry of Healing says that its watchword is ministry. So if we are not engaging in active service to uplift our fellow man, what is the purpose of having a church if we're not doing that? If we're not doing this, we might as well just close the doors of the church. And in a life of uh, service to Christ, connection with Christ is one of the first steps. This is an important part of one's what? So in my experience, as I was in church, um, I started to uh, get different responsibilities, spiritual responsibilities in the church. I was put on the nominating committee and, and all of these different type of things. Now, mind you, at this time, I'm, I'm about 16, 17, 18, 19, but I'm not fully aware of these principles. Now, mind you, even though I was raised Adventist, I didn't really know that we had a prophet. I didn't know about the sanctuary, health reform, any of that. I grew up eating meat, I, you know, doing all of these different type of things. So I didn't know this in principle, but God had me practicing it. You see, as the Holy Spirit starts to move upon an individual, God will lead them to practice things in the Bible that they've never read, but because the Spirit is leading them, God will guide and direct their steps. Does that make sense? All right. Anybody know what this is? This is, this is a symbol of training, this symbol of training. This is actually, if I'm not mistaken, this is a dictionary. This is a dictionary. Now, do you think in the work of God is just merely being converted enough in order to do proper service for our fellow man? No. And unfortunately, some people think that if I'm just converted, that this is all that I need to work for God. As long as I, you know, I, as long as I'm spiritual, that this is enough. But do you need proper training? Did Jesus properly train the disciples? Yes, he did. Did Jesus know what he was doing when he engaged in his work? Yes, he did. Now, one of the places <laughs> that I went to go get training was this. Does anybody know what this is? It's a place called Oakwood University. Yes, Oakwood University. Now, is, is this a secular school or a Christian school? This is not just a Christian school. This, this is a seven-day Adventist institution. Now, notice this. This is taken from Fundamentals of Christian Education. We're getting to a point. The youth are to be encouraged to attend our what? Follow me, follow me. Which should become more and more like the schools of the what? The schools of the prophets. Who here has studied the schools of the prophets? Like really in detail study the school of the prophets. I wish we had time to go through that. Our schools have been established by who? So did, was our, were our schools established by the board? Were they established by the denomination? Who are they established by? Now, does God use these mechanisms in order to do things? But who is the initiator of the institution? The Lord. Now, remember, I'm talking about training. Talking about training. I had to go through training in my experience. It says, and if they are conducted in harmony with his purpose. Now, what is the purpose of God in the earth right now? What is God's purpose in the earth at this particular time? There's a, there's a particular purpose. What's we'll say it again? Yes, yeah, so to prepare a people to stand true to God in the investigative judgment. We're told that this is the purpose. The youth, now, notice the purpose of our institutions. The youth sent to them will quickly be prepared to engage as lawyers and doctors and, and engineers. Is that what it says? What does that say? The various branches of what? Of missionary work. So were our schools established to train engineers? Were they established to train astronauts? They weren't established to do these things. Some will be trained to enter the field as missionary nurses, not, and notice, not just nurses, but missionary nurses. Is there a difference between a nurse and a missionary nurse? Yes, there is. Some as canvassers, some as evangelists, some as teachers, and some as gospel ministers. Does that make sense? Now, unfortunately, is this institution fulfilling that objective? Now, Oakwood University is just a small microcosm of a larger problem. Anybody know who this man is? Now, we, we, now we should know who this is. 
Yes, Martin Luther, if it was not for the labors of this man, we would not be here today. If it was not for this man, quite possibly, we would still be under the domination of the papacy right now. Notice what the man said. I am much afraid that the universities will prove to be the great gates of what? Of hell. Is that a serious statement? Do you think he was just playing around? No, he wasn't. Unless they diligently labor in explaining the Holy Scriptures and engraving them in the hearts of the youth. I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign what? Now, mind you, this does not mean that, that a Christian education is merely studying the world system and merely praying before class. That is not Christian education. When this says the scripture being paramount, this means that literally every subject is taught from the Bible. Whether it's chemistry, biology, physics, it doesn't matter what it is, it is to be taught from the sacred writings. Well, somebody says that this is foolishness. How in the world can you teach physics from the Bible? Now, can you teach physics from the Bible? Of course you can. Now, who is the God of physics? Who's the God of chemistry? Who's the God of astronomy? Who's the, who is the God of botany? God. But unfortunately, because we, we, we think that we need the world system of, and methodology of thinking, this is the reason, sadly, why the scriptures do not reign paramount. Notice, every institution in which men are not unceasingly occupied with the word of God must become what? Brothers and sisters, this is very solemn. Do you know God has ordained this particular institution, Butler Creek, this institution that we are now, to fulfill a mighty and glorious purpose? A mighty and glorious purpose. We're going to get into that. Notice. This says, our school was established not merely to teach the sciences, but for the purpose of giving instruction in the great principles of God's word and in the practical duties of everyday life. Notice this statement. This is the education so much needed at the present time. If a worldly influence is to bear sway in our school, then sell it out to worldlings and let them take in the entire control. Is that a serious statement? That's a serious statement. So if a worldly influence is bearing sway at this institution, Loma Linda, Walla Walla, Andrews University, the divine counsel is that the institution should be sold to worldlings and they should gain the entire control. You see, part of the reason why many times persons, you know, especially, you know, as we communicate these, you know, in different places, some person may be tempted to think that this type of counsel is too extreme. Now, why do you think a person would be tempted to think that this type of counsel is too extreme? Why do you think? Why do you think a person would be tempted to think that this type of counsel is too extreme? We're not converted? Okay. Now, is it possible to generally be converted, but just to be ill-informed? Yes. Now, are there many... Uh, God-fearing Christians who observe Sunday as the Sabbath? Are they genuinely converted? Yes, are they ill-informed? They're ill-informed. You see, exactly, the Bible says that where there is no vision, the people do what? We don't know the vision anymore. We don't know the vision of Seventh-day Adventism, so as a result of that, we think that institutions running on this worldly system, that there's nothing wrong with it. But that's not our point. We're going to go jump down. Does that, has anybody ever heard of this institution? Okay, so... Um, <laughs> no, 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 I understand. So I went to, I, I went to uh, Oka University. Um, I went there. And uh, unfortunately, I was going there to study theology. And I was going to Oakland to study theology, uh, but it was there that God brought some people within my circle that allowed me to come to an understanding of what we really believe as Seventh-day Adventists. Now, unfortunately, what we really believe as Seventh-day Adventists was not being taught in my classes at Oakwood. And I won't get into all the details, but I was a theology major, and what we studied was not the sanctuary. What we studied was not the spirit of prophecy. What we studied was not our message. The vast majority of our textbooks were written by Sunday ministers, but that's another subject. So the Lord impressed upon my mind that Oakwood and that type of system was not going to train me to be a proper gospel minister. So as a result of that, the Lord provided a different mechanism. 
Has anybody ever heard of this institution? Thank you. Meat Ministry. Yes, Meat Ministry. Now, Meat Ministry is a symbol. It is a symbol of a certain type of education. It is a symbol. Now, I had the privilege of going to Meat Ministry, and we're going to bring out some points as it relates to this. Now, we talked about the schools of the prophets. Does anybody know why the schools of the prophets were established? Why were the schools of the prophets established? Okay, so the parents weren't doing their job. The parents weren't doing... And what was the, the, the role of the parents? What were they to do with the children? So they were to educate their children. Now, these primary institutions that we had at Seventh-day Adventists, this was as a means to train and teach Seventh-day Adventist young people. Unfortunately, because our institution started to backslide, now our institution started to backslide long before any one of us were even born. Our institution started backsliding while Sister White was still alive. So as a result of that, God provided a different system of education. Anybody ever heard of Madison? Anybody heard of that institution? Has anybody ever heard of Avondale? Anybody ever heard of that institution? This was to be a symbol of the type of education that we were to have as Seventh-day Adventists. Now, mind you, every institution established by Seventh-day Adventists, whether it's uh, Andrews University, whether it's Oakwood University, Loma Linda, La Sierra, all of these institutions at one point were fulfilling God's purpose. At one point, all of them had large amounts of land, all of them were doing trades, all of them were, were training gospel workers. But unfortunately, it veered off the beaten path. All right, we're gonna come, come to a close. I know it's 11 o'clock. It says, to meet this growing evil, God provided other agencies as an aid to parents in the work of education. Notice. For the training of such a class of teachers, Samuel, my forefather, by the Lord's direction, established the schools of the what? S established the schools of the prophets. So Samuel, under God's direction, established these schools in order to counteract the apostasy that was happening in Israel. Does that make sense? All right. It says, I want my brethren to begin to understand some of the things for themselves. God alone, by the quickening, vivifying influence of the Holy Spirit, it says, if we can get away from the regular lines into something which, though irregular, is after God's order, it may cut away something of the irregular working which has led away from Bible what? You see, when Jesus and John the Baptist came on the scene, did they get trained in the school of the rabbis? Now, if the school of the rabbis were functioning properly, what profession would John the Baptist have engaged in? It starts with a P. He would have been a priest. Does that make sense? John the Baptist would have been a priest. He was of the, because of his father, he was of the tribe of? Okay, so he was of the tribe of Levi. But unfortunately, because of the nature of the rabbinical schools, he did not become a priest. But if things were proper, he would have become a priest. Does that make sense? Now, did, now what tribe was Jesus from? He's of the tribe of Judah. Now, was there any priesthood in the tribe of Judah? No priesthood. Now, what priesthood was Jesus a part of? The Melchizedek priesthood. Yes. <laughs> so he was of the Melchizedek priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood. So God wanted it that these mechanisms would do a work, but sadly, they fell into disrepute. All right. Anybody know what this is? Now, as the Lord brought me through this experience... The Lord brought me into a position where he was able to entrust me with a means uh, and, and, a me and, and a methodology of working. Notice what this says. Medical ministry. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy, and we're going to close on this point. 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, everyone is not going to be a gospel minister, but there are some points that I want us to understand from this. Though the, the, these texts are talking about the ministry, it's talking about gospel work in general. Notice, this is a true saying. If a man, uh, chapter 3, 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a what work? Good work. A bishop then must be blameless. Now, when this is blameless, does this really mean blameless? This really means blameless. So, so the standard for the ministry is very high. 
the husband of one wife, vigilant, and some person uh, may say, well, the, the, uh, the wife of one husband, but we won't get into that. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy for the lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all what? For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of what? Of what? Notice verse 6. Not a novice. What does that word novice mean? A person newly come to the faith. Yes, someone who is inexperienced. So when it comes to the work of God, whether you're a gospel worker, a canvasser, a Bible worker, whatever the case may be, a position of spiritual responsibility, should we be encouraging people with little experience to, to take on all of these spiritual responsibilities. Now, even if you're young in the faith, is there a place to do ministry? Yes, but many times, unfortunately, in the church, we put people in positions of spiritual responsibility that are not prepared for those environments. Does that make sense? Everything has its time and order. It says, the minister and his wife who are truly converted and who give themselves wholly to the work of the Lord are daily becoming more and more intelligent and efficient in their labors for others. They can open the scriptures to souls in such a way as to bring light to minds in darkness. So though this was not super extensive, this was just an illustration of how God has led me in my experience into the gospel ministry. And I really hope that by God's grace, these principles have been a blessing uh, to us in our own experience. Amen. All right, I'm just going to have a word of prayer and we will close. Dear Father, we thank you so much for what has been communicated. I pray, dear Lord, that you would please uh, continue to be with us as we go through this day of preparation, the Sabbath is soon to come in a short time. I pray they be with all those who may be on their way. Keep them safe. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.